So throughout this, I'm going to kind of just skim through some psychological experiments, but the, the real crux of this presentation is to kind of glean some inspiration for what event planners can do. So the first uh, psychological aspect that I'm going to look at is social influence and how you can change audience behaviors and beliefs. Now, there's a, a number of different types of conformity. Um, one of them is compliance. And uh, Janessa's bean jar experiment kind of shows this quite clearly. But, but there's, there's two types of compliance, right? So you have um, normative, which is where people are, are complying because they want to be liked, right? So you agree with your friends because you want them to, to, to like you. Oh, oh, I love Game of Thrones. I love Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Game of Thrones, Thrones too. Um, that's one type of, of conformity. Uh, then you also have um, informational. So informational compliance is where you are agreeing with people because you don't want to be wrong. So uh, for example, in this uh, bean jar experiment, what happened was everybody was asked to guess how many beans there are in this jar. Privately, uh, answers ranged from, you know, 50 to 5,000 uh, and, and the range was very broad. Um, but when they were asked to guess again as a group, suddenly there was a, a type of conformity where everyone was trying to kind of say roughly the same number because they were scared to be wrong. Now, what does this mean for event planners? Well, it's, it indicates a, a number of things. Uh, the first really is polling. Okay, so, you know, in some events, you might ask the audience and you might get a show of hands. Now, the problem with a show of hands is, you know, down to this uh, aspect of, of psychology would suggest that a lot of people would just agree with each other for the, for the sake of it. Now, it might be because the person is sitting next to them, they want to conform with uh, so they can be liked, or it might just be that they're scared to be wrong and, and want to go with the majority. Now, that's one argument for why anonymous polling, um, you know, on apps is, is useful and can potentially give you better answers. Uh, but more interestingly, and, and again, this is where it can kind of spark some creativity is, is obviously with panel discussions. So, you know, we all know that the best panel discussions are the ones where people disagree and, and you know, they, they give contrasting views. But how many times do you see a, a number of speakers on a panel and they're all agreeing with each other? And this is a form of compliance. You know, it's a form of, firstly, them not wanting to be wrong on stage. Um, and secondly, because they're on stage with people that they respect as well and, and therefore want to potentially be liked. So, you know, what can event planners do uh, to creatively kind of give a rawer, honest opinion from their panelists? Um, they could mix it up maybe and, and, you know, almost get them to answer anonymously through, through apps and, and polls, uh, you know, very binary questions and then discuss after that. So they've already made their views clear um, and then, then have to elaborate uh, uh, on stage in, in form of a discussion. Um, it's just one idea, but it's something to consider. Um, and again, as I said, you know, apps and, and polling is, is definitely um, interesting when you're thinking about it uh, from that perspective. So another type of conformity is identification. And this is quite interesting, uh, particularly um, for event planners because of Zimbardo's Stanford prison experiment. So this experiment actually got quite, quite a lot of stick because uh, morally it was a bit, um, you know, probably, probably wouldn't get away with it today. Um, but basically he uh, created a prison inside Stanford and uh, he had some student volunteers uh, as prison guards and other student volunteers as prisoners. They were given these roles. Now, what he found was it wasn't long before they started to conform into these roles. The, the prison guards became abusive. Um, they began to be very authoritative. They, they were commanding. They were rude. Um, and the prisoners were submissive or they were, you know, trying to under be underhand and, 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 you know, were engaging in, you know, potentially ways that they wouldn't have done uh, in real life. So what it shows is that when people are given a certain role, they can often conform into this role and change their behaviors. So now for an event planner, uh, when you're thinking about this, you know, think about the different roles that people are being asked to do 
uh, within an event. So when you have a speaker and you have an audience, instantly people are conforming to, to those roles. Uh, the speaker is, is talking and the audience is being quiet um, and, and non-interactive. But if you're trying to foster interactivity, if you're trying to create an event where the audience is more interactive, perhaps play with that identification a bit more. You know, Don't give them a chair to sit down and a stage for someone to stand on and talk to. Don't create those, uh, those roles. Um, you know, play with the layout a bit more. Obviously, you know, people are, are doing more events in the round. Um, but perhaps it can go further than that. You know, perhaps everyone is standing or uh, the, you know, everyone is sitting or, or there, there are a number of different ways that you can kind of make the, the grounds a little bit more level and therefore foster interactivity when, you know, people are often saying to them, well, why isn't the audience interacting? And it's, it's likely to because of, of, of what Zimbardo uh, achieved here. Um, now, this is also the same for incentives. Um, you know, often you get tiered incentives where, you know, those that have really performed um, are given, you know, the suites and, you know, the, the, the upper class uh, rooms uh, at the hotel. Uh, maybe they're given, you know, better flights or, um, you know, they just genuinely get the kind of slightly better treatment. Now, the problem with this is, um, you know, if, if we were looking at something like uh, Zimbardo's experiment, is that people then fall into those roles. And so there could be a type of superiority complex uh, that could come from, uh, you know, the top incentive winners. Now, obviously, if they've qualified, they should be rewarded, but perhaps, uh, you know, try to manage that uh, when organizing incentives so that the, the lower incentive winners and the higher incentive winners still mix, um, you know, because this psychological experiment would suggest that maybe those, uh, of the, the, the higher tier would maybe, you know, feel like they were slightly more superior. And that's not kind of the, you know, the relationship that you want to foster. Really, you want to kind of encourage people to come together and, and actually boost the performance of those at the lower end of the spectrum. So the final type of conformity uh, is internalization. And the reason I have a vegetable love heart here um, is because this is an example of this is where someone's not only adopting uh, conformity externally, but they are also um, accepting it internally. So perfect example might be that you've got three students living in a house. Uh, one of them is vegetarian. So the others decide to become vegetarian. Um, when they all move home or, or leave university, um, one person continues to be a vegetarian because they believe in the, uh, the morality of it or, or the arguments for it. Uh, the other one goes straight back to eating meat. And so uh, the person who continued to be a vegetarian, that is, is someone who's you know, internalized that conformity and has, and has actually kind of completely changed their behaviors. Now, this is the kind of thing that you want from an employee conference or um, if you're looking at, you know, sort of winning client loyalty, uh, you know, at a customer conference, you know, you really want to change people's behaviors entirely so that they're, you know, not just on the surface, but internally, they're also um, convinced by your messaging. Now, this is basically a form of, of minority influence. So um, there are three ways that a minority a smaller group of people can influence a larger group of people. And the reason I say minority influence is because if you think about any kind of conference, uh, so if it is an employee conference um, where you've got the senior leadership team, uh, the CEO, uh, the board, they are trying to, you know, change or, or influence, uh, you know, potentially thousands of employees. Um, again, this could be the same for a customer facing conference, um, in, in, in any context, really, it's usually a minority that is trying to influence. So these are the three forms of, of how to secure minority influence. The first is commitment, which pretty much is what it says on the tin. If someone is committed to their cause, uh, the chances are that you're probably more likely to listen to them and to actually consider their view. Um, then you have consistency. And this, is, this comes in two forms, so diachronic and synchronic. Now, diachronic is where someone... Um, is consistent over time. 
So if this is an annual conference or this is an event that happens monthly or however frequent it is, if there's a particular message that you're trying to, to get home, um, you know, to really hit home, um, whether or not if you're an agency and this is for a client or whether you're a corporate and this is, you know, this is what you're, you're being fed from, from above, the, the best way to, to influence that audience is to make sure that it's consistent over time. Um, now, synchronic is where the group, the minority, is all consistent with each other. So again, this comes back to, you know, briefing speakers or, or you know, particularly speakers of a brand. Uh, so if you're talking about a corporate um, and the board, making sure that they're all very consistent uh, with the language they're using um, and the messaging that they're putting forward. Now that in itself becomes more influential because everybody's, you know, singing from the same hymn sheet as it was. Now, consistency can sometimes be contested and has been uh, challenged um, in terms of uh, the importance of flexibility. So some say that, you know, you need to be consistent and, you know, you, you stand your ground. Um, but then obviously you have flexibility uh, in Nameth's uh, mock jury experiment where they gathered a number of people to sit on a jury and um, the idea was to try and get one person to be able to influence uh, the majority. Now, they were arguing over the compensation of an individual who'd had a skiing accident. So the, um, the minority was pushing for um, a small amount and the, the majority were pushing for a very large amount and uh, neither was changing. Now, the minority then shifted slightly uh, towards, towards the, the larger sum um, and this then influenced the majority and they came down. So there it's a slight challenge to to the consistency but i think that kind of applies more when uh you're sort of thinking about uh, s smaller kind of uh, back and forth discussions but i think when it comes to conferences you know the commitment and the consistency is, is probably key when it comes to messaging and uh, what you're trying to push forward for for any kind of strategy because you know at the end of the day every event has some sort of strategic purpose to it Next, I'm going to talk about memory and engagement. So this is the multi-store model. Now, this is, you know, somewhat contested. Uh, again, everything in psychology uh, isn't, isn't as black and white as it, as it could be. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is that actually there are some things here that the event planners can take away that could potentially work quite well for them. So the way that Atkinson and Schifrin suggest that our memory works is that you have a sensory store um, then with enough attention, this goes into your short-term memory. Um, then with enough rehearsal, that transfers into long-term memory. And obviously, you can then retrieve from the long-term memory uh, at, at any point. Um, very simple. You know, you, you go into a room, you see something. If you pay enough attention to it, it goes into short-term memory. And then if you keep revising it, then it will go into your long-term memory. Looking at short-term memory... Uh, they say that the duration is somewhere between zero and 18 seconds and the capacity is seven plus or minus two items. So if you think about the number plate on a car in the UK, uh, it's seven. Let me just double check. Yep. It's seven characters, uh, which means that we can memorize it, uh, very short term. You can say, right, I know that number plate, uh, when potentially having to write it down or report it to the police. Um, but interestingly, and I think that the, the key point here is that the encoding for short term memory is mainly acoustic. Now, what that means is how the short term memory processes things uh, is, is, is primarily through sound um, and, and music. So, uh, you know, everybody uses music at events, but potentially we should be thinking a little bit more about it. And the reason I have McDonald's here is because I'm sure that most of you just from seeing those words, I'm loving it, have heard the do 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 do. And it's stuck in your head. And instantly, suddenly, you're associating uh, McDonald's with, with loving it. And, uh, and therefore, it's, it's stuck in your head. Um, and so many jingles on TV, you know, they're a couple of seconds, zero to 18 seconds long. Um, they, they stick in your head and they are effective uh, when it comes to remembering them, right? Um, rather than just saying a message, perhaps turning it into, you know, into a song. Um, now I know this might be a bit, uh, might be a bit cliche or it might kind of come across as a bit cheesy. 
Um, but I think music in general should be considered a bit more um, strategically when, when we're planning events, because actually there is definitely something behind this uh, in terms of the way that our brains process information. If you think about how it's very easy to remember the words to a song, but often, you know, if asked to remember a speech of the same length, we'd probably struggle. Um, I think if you look at this in the incentives world, uh, you know, how many times do you hear a song and instantly you get a flashback to a holiday that you were on, you know, and some good times and some good memories, you know, is anybody really thinking about music that they're playing or, or thinking about deliberately playing music in certain parts of these once in a lifetime trips uh, to then foster a trigger that uh, people will, will never forget. So, you know, using music and acoustic encoding is something that should potentially be considered a little bit more rather than just, oh, you know, what's the intro music for this next speaker just to break up uh, sounds and things. Now, long-term memory, uh, they say the duration is unlimited, the capacity is unlimited, and the encoding is mainly semantic, um, but it can be visual and acoustic as well, of course. But the, the, the problem and the challenge with this is, uh, you know, if we look at that multi-store model that I mentioned earlier, was that that suggests that anything can go in the long-term memory as long as it's rehearsed and revised enough, right? Um, you know, you go through it enough and bam, it goes into your long-term memory. But actually the argument is that, you know, students can revise and revise and revise and revise and they, they can't seem to remember the information they need. Um, but when they're really interested in a magazine, for example, suddenly they can remember the article they just read. So um, there's a copy of a very interesting magazine, which is CNIT, of course. Um, so really what this is illustrating is that to, to get things into the long-term memory, it's not just about rehearsal, but also about grabbing their attention, which lends nicely to my next section, which is about attention spans. So there have been studies, uh, so this is from Weizel, that suggests that the attention span of a human being is decreasing uh, to below that of a goldfish. So in 2000, our attention spans were 12 seconds. In 2015, they were eight seconds and descending. A goldfish attention span is nine seconds. Um, you know, they also found that 25% of teens forget major details of close friends and relatives. Um, I don't think it's just teens, to be honest. I've been guilty of also doing that. Um, and, you know, the average worker will check their email inbox about 30 times an hour or their phone 1,500 times a week. So attention spans are, are suffering, it would suggest. However, uh, a study from Prezi uh, actually says that the goldfish theory might be popular, but our results suggest that today's workforce operates under the opposite narrative. So actually our attention spans aren't decreasing, they're just being more selective. Uh, six out of 10 uh, said that they would give content their undivided attention now more than they would a year ago. And 49% of them are saying that they're more selective about their content. Um, and just to say, this was not, you know, they, they, they broke this down based on demographic of age. And it wasn't millennials. Everyone loves to blame millennials and say, oh, attention spans. Oh, it's all those millennials. You know, those, those millennials just won't pay attention. But actually, it was found that 40% of millennials said that they can hold uh, content, good content can hold their attention uh, without distraction for a long time versus 35% from Gen X and 31% from baby boomers. So actually their attention spans are potentially higher. Now, the reason I have the Netflix logo here is because if you think about it, there are certain things that we can watch and binge watch for hours, right? Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean that content uh, at events now has to be you know, 15 seconds long in order to, to, you know, to get people to consider it. Um, but actually, maybe we should be adopting more of a Netflix approach. And this is, this is twofold. One, Netflix provides you with choice. Okay, so that opportunity to pick and choose what you want. Um, but, but two, Netflix uses a lot of data. Uh, House of Cards success was, was famously credited to the fact that they did a lot of number crunching and data analytics uh, that found that people liked um, political dramas and they also liked at the time, probably not now, Kevin Spacey. Uh, so they put the two together and they had success. Um, so it's those kind of things that event planners can think about when producing content. 
And what gets, what gets people's attention? So the same study found that, you know, 55% said they want a great story. 41% say they want stimulating dialogue. 33% say visual stimulation. Um, and 79% uh, said the use of animated visuals is effective in keeping the audience engaged. This is true. Um, and you would think, well, Callum, why haven't you got lots of animation in your, in your presentation then? And uh, there's, there's another reason for that. And uh, I will talk to you now about changing perceptions. So the ethos or the cognitive perspective uh, suggests that you instantly associate a speaker um, with, uh, so the quality of the speaker based on the quality of the surroundings or the production, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, if, for instance, I'd complicated this presentation with lots of fancy, fancy animations and one of them went wrong or something went wrong instantly, you would therefore associate me with the same level of quality, right? So this, this goes much further than just, you know, speaker and content. This goes to venue, this goes to destination, this goes to the entire experience. People instantly get a perception from their surroundings uh, and, and the quality around them um, and associate it with the company, the brand, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, when you're thinking, oh, well, actually, maybe we'll go for this really cheap venue, but we'll just put more into, you know, the production or something, you know, think very carefully about that when making those decisions because of this ethos cognitive perspective. Um, now, the reason I have a picture of the golden ticket there and, and, you know, the Aurora and things is because there is the scarcity theory. So this ties in quite nicely with um, incentives, but also links to uh, events in general. So th the idea very simply, people place more value on things if they think that it's rare, you know? So if a ticket to an event uh, is limited and uh, is, is, is that golden ticket and people think that they might not be able to get there, they're going to place more value on it. If there is an incentive trip that is only available for 50 people, then they are going to place more value on it. And so while incentives is quite obvious, perhaps taking that same uh, ideology when it comes to events is something that can make event marketing a little bit more powerful when thinking about trying to attract delegates. You then have classical conditioning. Um, yes, uh, it's always good to have a puppy in your slideshows because I'm sure at least one person just now said, ah. Oh. Um, now, Pavlov's dogs, everyone's probably heard of that psychological experiment, but quite simply, uh, Pavlov would, um, he wanted to know why his dogs were salivating every time they saw someone with a lab coat. It wasn't because they thought that, you know, scientists look tasty. It was because, uh, they associated those particular lab coats with the person that was going to feed them. So he did it the same with a bell, a rang a bell every time he fed the dogs and soon at just the sound of a bell, they would salivate. Now, the reason I include this is because we're constantly trying to change people's behaviors at events. You know, we're trying to get them to adopt new technology, um, you know, and, and, you know, kind of come on board with some sort of new gadget or something. Um, now, this can often, often sometimes be harder. People always pick up the paper agenda, even though you're trying to get them to, to go onto the app. But the best way to do that is, to be honest, train people like dogs, okay? If you give them a treat, then they will, they will kind of react positively to it. Um, you know, gamification is a perfect example of this. Uh, people get excited about, you know, points and, and competitiveness and things like that. Um, all of those kind of things work very, very well. You also then have the recipro reciprocity. <laughs> I really should have tried to say that word a few more times before doing this, but yes, um, the, the theory is that basically if someone does some, if a, if a company does something nice for you, you will then reciprocate and uh, you will want to do something nice for them. Now, again, obviously this uh, applies to incentives very, very obviously. Uh, you know, if you get to go on an amazing incentive trip, then you are going to say, do you know what, that company's great and I'm going to perform to the best of my ability. But also, you know, this links to corporate gifting, uh, potentially having, you know, actually, actually having good gifts at a conference. Um, but, you know, sometimes it doesn't even have to be uh, something financial. You know, if, if you're teaching people a new skill uh, or you're giving them something that they really want, then instantly there is going to be that, uh, that gratitude and therefore that, you know, reciprocity. I'm not even going to say it anymore. I'm not even going to say I'm going to move on to the next slide. So then you have loss aversion. Uh, loss aversion refers to people's tendency to prefer to avoid losing things 
uh, rather than gain anything. So when given the option to either lose $5 or to gain $5, people would rather, um, they'd rather not lose the $5. Uh, now this, basically people don't want to lose out. Okay. The, the, that, the idea of, of, of losing out upsets them. It's, it's FOMO in, in one way or another. Now, obviously this is, is quite good for event marketing in an aspect of, you know, making it so that the event seems so valuable that actually this is going to cost them if they don't go, um, you know, depending on the type of event you can, if it's an educational one, you can sort of say that the knowledge that they're going to gain is, is invaluable. And actually that if they don't go, they are going to lose the $5. Finally, you have emotional priming. Um, so instantly after seeing that picture, you've probably got a little bit of a warm, fuzzy feeling. Maybe you can even smell some cinnamon. Uh, you know, you're a little bit happier because you see those, those Christmas lights, you see the fire, you see the, and instantly you have all of those associations that are coming to your head uh, around the beauty of Christmas, right? Now, North et al. Uh, it always sounds more, um, you know, scientific when you say et al. But yeah, there, there was an experiment around music and wine where in a supermarket they played uh, French music uh, every other day and German music every other day. And it turned out that the French wine sold more on the French music days and the German wine sold more on the German music days. Uh, but when surveyed, the customers had no idea that there was even music playing. Now this is, you know, obviously it links to sort of subliminal messaging and, and things like that. Um, and if ever you've seen the film Focus with Will Smith and Margot Robbie, uh, there's a particularly great scene in that where uh, he kind of uses this same sort of idea of emotional priming and, and subliminal messaging to influence a, a con. Um, now, this is the kind of thing that we can do in events that doesn't have to be as uh, sinister as that, but can influence uh, the kind of feelings that people get from entering the room. And this links to colors. So I'm just going to very, very briefly run through the different colors and what they mean. So red is associated with high energy and stimulates. So if you're trying to create these kind of emotional states, uh, then pretend, potentially use more red. Um, obviously you will have, you know, I understand that you, you've got brand colors to adhere to, but at the same time, you know, whether it's using a red room or, or something like that, whatever you're trying to foster, um, this, is, this is kind of the emotion for that. Uh, green is relaxing and balances. That's why, you know, Starbucks use that. They, they want you to come into their coffee shops. They want you to relax. They want you to feel Zen um, and, and spend lots of time there. And so, you know, if you're having breakout rooms where you probably want people to be a bit more relaxed and, and to compose their thoughts, maybe think about green. Blue is apparently trustworthy and calms. Uh, it's no surprise then that lots of corporate uh, companies use this color. Uh, banks, you know, such as Barclays, they, they want to uh, invoke trust and they want people to, to feel that they can uh, rely on them. Yellow, orange is, is, is associated with happiness and, and energizes. Uh, if you think about the Happy Meal, that's a very simple way. Or, you know, the sun, a ray of sunshine. You know, it's, it's that that positive feeling that, that comes from the color of yellow. And finally, purple is said to be uh, creative and wise. So if you're trying to foster creativity uh, in, in, a, in a group uh, or in a breakout session or as a, as a whole in the conference, then maybe consider using uh, purples and, and things like that. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not an expert in the science of the mind. But um, I did study it briefly, and uh, I can take inspiration from these aspects. I think that the key thing for everyone to realize is that, you know, when you're doing an event, it's, it's because you're trying to, you know, you, 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 there's a strategy, there is a focus, there is a purpose. And so whatever it is you're trying to do, whether it is trying to get someone to learn something, whether it's trying to, you know, change their behavior, whether it's trying to persuade, um, you know, there is a number of different psychological aspects that you don't realize uh, you can influence um, through these kind of thinking. So, you know, just have a think about what it is you're trying to achieve with your event on a very basic granular level uh, when it comes to the human mind. And then, you know, do a little bit of research. It didn't take long to, to find some of, the, some of the findings that I've shared with you today. Um, you know, think about the, the colors you use. Think about using more uh, acoustics. Uh, think about how you can get people to remember the content. Um, 
and hopefully that will allow you to uh, achieve the goals that you're hoping to achieve.